In my last episode, I talked about the main sequence. This is the name we give to stars who are burning hydrogen as their fuel source. They spend about 90% of their lives, no matter the kind of star, about 90% of its life will be spent burning hydrogen. And when it does that, it lives along a narrow track on something we call the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. I know I'm throwing a lot of jargon at you, but deal with it. The Hertzsprung-Russell diagram connects a star's temperature to its true brightness. It allows us to build a relationship there. And there's, uh, there is this tight connection for stars that are burning hydrogen between their brightness, their true brightness, and their temperature. We call that track the main sequence. Now, when stars near the end of their lives, they move off of the main sequence. They have different relationships between their true brightness, also known as their luminosity, and their temperature. In which case, when this happens, they get a new name. Now, this name doesn't really have a fixed definition, but it's something that like every astronomer understands anyway. It's... <clears throat> Anyway, for stars that live on the main sequence, another name for them are dwarf stars. Yes, even our sun, which is a pretty large star as far as stars go, is a dwarf star. And then when a star moves off of the main sequence, when it's done burning hydrogen, it tends to go up in brightness. And it also becomes physically large, hence it gets the name giant. So dwarf stars are the stars that are burning hydrogen on the main sequence, giant stars that have moved off of the main sequence and are nearing the end of their lives. Now, you may have heard either by watching one of my videos or just knowing things about spectral classification. There can be O-type stars and K-type stars and M-type stars. And for stars that are living on the main sequence, there's a connection between the star's spectral type and its temperature, its size, its mass, like all sorts of cool things about the star. That only applies to stars on the main sequence. That only applies to dwarf stars. Once a star moves off the main sequence, once it's done burning hydrogen, once it, once it switches to burning something else for fusion, like helium or carbon or silicon or whatever, this relationship between its spectral class and its size and temperature totally breaks down. For example, when we're looking at the giant stars, we can have giant red stars, which would be called an M-type star because it's red. We can also have giant blue type stars. Blue stars are O type stars. So you can have red stars that are bigger than blue stars, even though on the main sequence that would be totally impossible, but we're not living on the main sequence anymore. We're going off the rails. The reason the stars get bigger near the ends of their lives is that fusion stops happening in the core and instead fusion starts to happen in a shell surrounding the core. And sometimes you can get, even get multiple layers of fusion all happening at once. So because the action, the intensity is happening in an expanded shell, this causes the rest of the star to swell. Now, if it's a truly, truly, truly massive star, like greater than 40 times the mass of the sun, the outer layers can swell. This star can get thousands of times wider than the sun, and it can become hundreds of thousands and even millions of times brighter than the sun. And because it's so massive, there's so much gravity, there's so much energy, this thing can just keep on pumping out light and stay bright and hot and blue. These are what we call the blue giants. But sometimes we even have stars bigger than that. We call those the blue supergiants. And sometimes we have stars bigger than that. We call those the blue hypergiants. And sometimes we have stars that aren't quite giants. So we call them subgiants. It's... <sighs> if it's large, if it has a lot of mass, and it's moved off the main sequence, it's burning something else in its core. It's like burning helium in the core with a few with hydrogen burning in a shell around it. It can keep pumping out the energy and it'll just be a giant star that is blue. 
If it's less than 40 solar masses, then when this stage happens, when there's helium fusion in the core, there's hydrogen fusion in a shell around that, uh, it doesn't have enough power to really stay bright on the edges. So even though the star swells and gets much, much, much larger, the surface cools down. So even though it's very bright because there's a lot of surface area to pump out light, it's not very hot. And so these get classified as M-type. These are red stars, but they're red giant stars. So uh, a, a famous red giant star is Betelgeuse in the constellation Orion. It is a red supergiant star. Uh, another star in the constellation Orion is a blue supergiant, Rigel. So both of these stars are near the end of their lives, but going in different directions. Uh, one came out a blue supergiant, the other came out a red supergiant. In fact, the vast majority of stars that you see on the sky, the ones visible to the naked eye, are these supergiant stars. So even though they're a very, very rare star, they're very, very bright, and they're easy for the eyeball to see. So almost every star you see is actually a star near the end of its life, way brighter, way hotter, way more intense than it ought to be. If one of this cool fact that has absolutely nothing to do with spectral type, but I love this fact, uh, the furthest star you can see with the naked eye is around 14,000 light years away. It's it's a blue supergiant star. I forget the name. I think it's V67 Cassiopeia, if I remember right. In that same volume, you can see a, like a ball of radius 14,000 light years. You can see about 6,000 other stars with the naked eye, right? But there are more stars out there that you simply can't see because they're too small and too dim. So in that same volume, a sphere with a radius 14,000 light years, there's like, I don't know, like 20 billion stars. So 6,000 that you can see, 20 billion that you can't. You see the supergiant stars. You see the stars that have evolved off the main sequence and are about to blow up in spectacular fashion. You don't get to see the normal everyday stuff. Stars just, just live in their lives. But speaking of lives, what I want to talk about next week is how stars get started in the first place. In the meantime, please go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter to keep these shows going and to please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. I really do appreciate it. And I thank you and I'll see you next week.